time on Friday night. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Chapter 7, we are going to continue our series through the book of Ecclesiastes, Pursuing Meaning. And we are now in one of the most challenging part of this book. So I want to I warn you this morning that this is a very challenging part of this book. Because in order to have meaning, we need wisdom. And Solomon has been kind of telling us all along that he's after wisdom. He told us the beginning that, that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And so the book of wisdom is three books, right? We have Proverbs, we have Ecclesiastes, we have the book of Job. And so here in chapter 7, this is classic Solomon now giving you some wisdom sayings. Proverbs is basically wisdom sayings, right? And so we're going to cover some things here that are not easy to cover because these are things we don't want to talk about sometimes. These are things we don't want to go there, but you don't have meaning without facing these things. And I want to give you those four things off the bat right now if you're taking notes because this is where we're going to go today, right? We're going to talk about pursuing wisdom, but he's talking to us about death, right? Nothing more guaranteed than that in this life, but the thing we want to avoid the most at the same time. So we're going to talk about death, right? And then we're going to talk about criticism. You can't grow without criticism. Hello, somebody. Right? And we're going to talk about compromise, how some people want meaning, but with compromise. And then we're going to talk about the mystery of God's will. Sometimes we don't know the fullness of things. Right? So those four things are going to be the focus here. Again, not easy, but I hope that we are mature enough to want to grow and not just be on the surface and be shallow. Can you say amen? amen. So in Ecclesiastes, wisdom is a big deal. Matter of fact, 54 times he talks about wisdom. And I want to make sure that we're on the same page. When we say the word wisdom, here's what we mean. We mean Number one thing about wisdom that we mean, if you're taking notes, is spiritual insight. Wisdom is spiritual insight. In other words, wisdom is, is what is going on beneath the surface. Wisdom is what's really happening that you don't just see on the surface. You ever watch a movie and as the movie unfolds, the premises is unfolding, and you're like, what, what's really going on? And if you're one of those people, never watch movies with people who don't pay attention. Because they're asking you a lot of questions. It's like, pay attention. Movie's going somewhere. You're over here like, what just happened? You know, wisdom is it's what's happening beneath the surface. It's, it's spiritual insight. Right? Wisdom is looking at a situation and saying, God, what's really going on here? What am I missing here? What, am I, what, what do I need to gain from this? That's spiritual insight. It's not just taking things at face value. Wisdom is, I need to go under the surface. I need to go under the hood to know what's really good. Hello, somebody. I can rap too, you know. The second thing that Solomon keeps telling us is that wisdom is having eternal perspective. Wisdom is having eternal perspective. In other words, I'm an eternal being. So I don't just live for the moment. Right? He told us that there's a difference between under the sun and above the sun. Right? And he says if you just live life from under the sun standpoint, you're going to have a very limited perspective. Right? But you need a above the sun or in the sun, right? S-O-N perspective. When you're living in Jesus, it's a different perspective. We are eternal beings. We are on a journey. We're passing through this life. We're not here to stay. Are you tracking with me? The third thing is that wisdom is discernment. I sound like a broken record, but I, I really believe this with all my heart. The greatest need of our day is the need for discernment. Because there's a lot happening in our world right now 
that if you're not discerning your way through it, you might fall for things that are not God's will. Our society is anti-God right now. If we're not paying attention, we might be going with the current, but the Bible says do not conform to the ways of the world, but be transformed. How? By renewing your mind so you may know what is God's best, pleasant, and perfect will. That takes discernment. Discernment is distinguishing between what's good and what's not. The great Spurgeon said discernment is, is the ability to know what's right and almost right. The sermon is the difference between good and great, right? The sermon is the ability to distinguish not everything is from God. I I need to say something here to us. You need to discern the spirits, the Bible says. Not every spirit is from God. You need to discern... That there are things in our society right now that is demonic. It's not the Holy Spirit. There are things in our society right now that it sounds good, but beneath the surface, it's evil. And the Bible says, beware of the days where good will be called evil, evil will be called good. We need to discern God's will through a lot of For lack of better words, crap going on right now. My wife told me not to say crap. Pray for me that I don't say crap. But there's a lot of crappiness going on in our society right now. And we need to discern our way through it. And parents, you need to help your kids discern their way through a lot of junk. (laughs) Discernment is clutch. It's actually one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Pray for discernment. We can't just take things at face value anymore. Discern your way through it. Discern what I'm saying. You should be discerning what I'm saying. Right? That's why I'm telling people, like, bring your Bibles to church. So what I'm saying something, go look and see if I'm telling you what's in the Bible or not. So I'm not here to tell you what I think. I'm here to teach you what the Word teaches. Can you say Amen. And bottom line of discernment is that you have this healthy fear of God. This is the wisdom that Solomon keeps hinting at. He's saying the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is the fear of God? We've been talking about this. The fear of God is is reverence, respect, honor, and obedience. That's when you know you really fear the Lord. That you have a healthy reverence for him. You have a respect for him. See, one of the things you have to discern in our society is people like to say that God is love. And he he is love, but he's more than that. He's also holy. He is righteous. He is just. And God's not going to co-sign your nonsense. God's not going to co-sign your sin. Right? We say God is love, but it's like, yeah, God is love, but he defines love the way that he is love, not the way that we think love should be defined. Because a lot of times what people are calling love is really lust. So the fear of the Lord says, no, I need to not just pay attention. I need to obey his wisdom because that's where I begin to live. When I have a real healthy reverence for who God is. Can you say amen? Amen. And so as we get to chapter 7, he just does his classical way of helping us understand wisdom. And so I'm going to break this down into those four areas. So we're going to read the first four chapters. It's going to be one of those crockpot messages. So I hope you you lean in because we're going somewhere here. But he starts by saying this in chapter 7. He says, a good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. And the day you die is better than the day you are born. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies. So the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For sadness has a refining influence on us. 
A wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. See why this is so challenging for us? We don't want to think about death. We want to believe that we're going to live forever. But the reality is, death is a very much part of life. You can't escape it. What do they say? Death and taxes? <laughs> Some of y'all are ducking the IRS. So I'll just focus on death. He says a good reputation. A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. What, what is he getting at? Why is he tying in this with death? It's a question that I got to ask you this morning is, what will people say at your funeral? See, I, I've made this joke, but I'm kind of serious when I say this. I don't want to lie at your funeral. You shouldn't put your pastor in a position to lie at your funeral. Because a funeral is a time to remember the person, how they really lived. And that's why he's saying it's, it's better to have a good reputation. How you live reflects how you are honored when you die. Not just by us, but by God. A wise person lives with eternity in mind. A wise person is thinking about the end. Because it's not if, it's when. It will come. The end will come. It will come for all of us. And we don't know, we don't have any guarantees. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. The Bible says worry about today because today is all you have. So it's going to come. And a wise person, someone who has the understanding of God, is thinking about their reality. One day I'm going to stand before my creator. I have to give an account for my life. How I live echoes in eternity. Eternity is, con is a continuation of how I lived here. On this life. My friends, that's why there's a heaven and there's a hell. Each one is a continuation of how I live this life here. So I need to think about these things. It's important that I have a perspective on eternity because I am an eternal being. I don't become an eternal being when I die. I am an eternal being now. In this moment. And the Bible says that eternal life is to know Jesus. It's not to go to heaven, it's to know Jesus. Because if you don't know Jesus in this life, then how are you going to know him in the next one? Because the next one is a continuation of what you started here on this earth. That's why I don't have to lie at your funeral if you're living for Jesus now. Notice he said, he said, sadness has a refining influence on us. I love that. He, what he's saying is, he said, pay attention because, because you get the most out of life in the moments when you're sad. Your greatest lesson in life comes when you're sad. You barely learn anything in life when you're laughing. Usually, now I pray you get this, again, this is a mature word. Usually, sadness can turn into laughter if we appropriate ourselves for the sadness. This is why the Bible says that we may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. But you have to endure the weeping and have a perspective that this weeping is teaching me something. It's molding me. It's shaping me. And I'm able to laugh about it because I see the refining process of this sorrow. 
In other words, God doesn't waste your pain. God doesn't waste any moment of sadness, of suffering. Matter of fact, Jesus told us that it's through many sufferings that we will make it home. No one is, an ex- is exempt from sadness, from suffering. The difference is a wise person learned from suffering, a fool just suffers. We're all going to suffer, but can the suffering teach us anything? Because he says here, sadness is a refining. I love that word refining because it's the same word used for the refiner's fire. That, that suffering has a way of purifying us, of purging us, of cleansing us, of, of distilling us down to what really matters. Quiet in this Baptist church. But that's a good word. Moments of sadness makes us reflect on what really matters. That's why he says it's better to spend some time at a funeral because there's nothing more powerful than a funeral because funerals says, here's life. What are you going to do about your life? I always say the same thing at funerals. I always say, listen, if you're in a funeral, it's because God has allowed you to pause. It's not about the person who was passed because that person, their journey is done. Funeral is more about the living than it is about the dying. Funeral is about the ones who are still here living like fools. As opposed to paying attention that we are here passing through. Are you tracking with me? Sadness makes you take inventory of what really matters. It's not until your heart is broken that you start taking inventory. A fool has a broken heart and blames people. A wise person has a broken heart and says, what's going to come out of this? A fool will get into a rebound relationship. A wise person says, I need to take an inventory before I jump into another thing. This is a word. Our greatest lesson in life comes from tough moments. Life will force you to pause. Now, what you do with that pause is the difference between a wise person and a fool. Life will, will, will I say this all the time, life will force you to your knees. And you, make the, you have to pause. Like, there's, there's no guarantees in life, my friends. This is what Solomon is trying to get us to understand. He says a white person thinks, thinks a lot about death. And that sounds morbid on the surface. Sounds morbid to think about dying. But it's a reality you must face head on. And I, and I believe this. I, I think the more you face it head on, the more you're prepared for it. Better yet, the more you will live your life to the fullest now, knowing that that is coming So I pray we understand this is not a morbid, like, thinking morbidly about death. No, this is a wise understanding that this is a reality of life that I need to be prepared for. And if I face it with the Lord, then I'm going to have the right perspective. Because I have an eternal perspective. I'm not going to be an eternal being. I am an eternal being. A fool thinks only about having a good time. Not knowing that they're gradually going to hell. C.S. Lewis said that the road to hell is gradual. It's a slow process to hell. Why? Because a fool is only thinking about himself. He's not thinking about the fact that he has a creator. That he's going to give a, a kind of account to. You could be in church and go to hell. I did a funeral the other day. A man asked me, what does he have to do to go to heaven? And he says, I try to be a good person. And I said, sir, there's a lot of good people in hell. There's a lot of religious people in hell. And then I, and then he, and then I shocked him with this. I said, sir, there are no good people in heaven. Only saved ones.
until you realize your need for a savior, you will think you are your own savior. And C.S. Lewis goes on to say this is a powerful thing. C.S. Lewis says in the end, God will say two things. Depending on if you're wise or you're fool, God will either say, your will be done or my will be done. So in the end, it's like we're saying to God, your will be done and my will be done. Depending on how you want to live your life. It's interesting that temporary living is like building a house on the sand. Because sooner or later that house is going to crumble. Everything comes crumbling down. Everything comes to an end. But eternal living is knowing that it's a continuation. It doesn't stop here. I love the Apostle Paul's conviction in Philippians chapter 1. He says this, he says, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. For me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's someone who understands that their salvation is not hinged on their goodness, is not hinged on their religiosity, is not hinged on being a good person, is hinged on the fact that they live for Jesus in this life And so dying is gaining because you're going to live with him for all eternity. To live is Christ. To live is to not be a good person. To live is to not be religious. To live is Christ. Because Christ is eternal life. To know Jesus is to know eternal life. Jesus said, when you look at me, you look at the Father. So when you look at the Father, it's like you are in eternity. Starting now. To live is Christ. Today's game. I need to make this point very clear. Please hear me on this. This falls every week and I never learn. (laughs) What a fool. (laughs) I need you to hear me on this, friends. Coming to church on a Sunday morning does not mean you're living for Jesus. Living for Jesus is that you have surrendered your life to Him, He is the Lord. He's the Savior. He's the provider of your life. And so every day you're living in that reality. So when this reality ends, you're entering into the next one, the next realm of what you already started here. I cannot make this clear enough. You do not go to heaven because you got baptized or catechized or because your mom is a Christian or because you're a good person. You go to heaven because you've embraced that Jesus is the only way of salvation. If I don't trust them now, then there's nothing that a priest can say at your funeral that will change your eternity. There are no amount of masses that people can do for you. There are no purgatory. Let me make this clear. There's no such thing as purgatory. The moment you die, you're either in the presence of God or you're away from him. And I say that to scare all of us because you have to have a healthy fear of God. People are like... You know, I, I don't want to be scared. Well, you're scared either way. <laughs> scared either way. Oh, I love this one. I don't believe there's a hell. doesn't matter. You know some people, they only believe there's a heaven but not a hell? I don't care how much choosing you do, you're still going to face this reality. Now, the beauty of this is Jesus has done everything within his power to make sure no one goes to hell. If you go to hell because you chose to. Now, while we're in the subject of hell, let me make this clear because we have a wrong understanding of hell. When When you read hell in the Bible, when Jesus talks about flames and all of that, there's all metaphors. Why does he use a lot of flames and people burning It's disintegration. It's not necessarily a literal thing. He's saying like it's disintegrating away, away, and away, away from what God intended for you. So there's no like fires in hell. It's just a metaphor of the reality that fire disintegrates you into nothing. That's the reality of hell is living for eternity without understanding who God is. By the way, I might preach on hell on Christmas Day. I've been thinking about this. Happy Christmas. (laughs) 
Because there's great lessons that we need to learn from hell. Hell was never God's intention for humanity. That's why he sent his son. But humans are bent on living without... You know what's interesting? C.S. Lewis wrote a great book on hell called The Great Divorce. He says, in hell, no one wants to get out. Because their minds made it in your way up. They, they, that's what they want. They choose that. So when people say, how can a loving God send people to hell? God will never send anyone to hell. That's a choice. Just like I can't force you to do anything without violating your free will. Are you tracking with me? I know it's a little heavy, but we got to go there. And so, look, Psalms 90, I love this. He says this. He says, look, here's a great prayer. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. It's a great prayer. Lord, teach us to realize the brevity of life. You know what the brevity of life means? Life is short. It's like a vapor, the Bible says, right? Here today, gone tomorrow. So, so teach us to realize this reality so that we can grow in wisdom. What is the wisdom? Everything I talked about. Eternal perspective, fear of God, living right, righteous, living. It says, teach us, Lord, how to live like that. Because most people are not thinking about this. Most people are just thinking, how can I be happy? But it's like, you can live for happiness and miss God. But if you get ha- God, you usually can get happiness too. Problem is, we're, we're chasing everything other than the one that can give us the things we're chasing. Which is our creator. So we gotta, we got to face this head on. You know, I don't want to be morbid about it. I told my wife the other day, we had a long conversation about this. I said, listen, I think about that all the time. Not in a morbid way. I just want to live life to the fullest now. I want each day to count. Because I don't know how many I have. None of us know. But I want to live it to the fullest. And I really believe this, right? I think that if you live in Jesus, you live with less and less fear of what's to come. Not just that, but I think that you will enjoy this life even more knowing who you are in him. So I told her, here's my plan. Let's make talking about death normal. Not weird. Because it's true. Like at the heart of our faith is a God who died and rose again. Like, that's the point of Christianity. He defeated the very thing that we're scared of. And he's like, on the other side of this going, guys, it's going to be okay. I have defeated death. So let's make dying great again. (laughs) Good night. I don't know. I really love that one. That was great. (laughs) Now that you're loose, can we talk about criticisms? Because while we're here, that's part of life. Let's talk about criticism because it's so important. This is, unfortunately, this is where most people don't pass the test. But criticism is part of life. If you want to have a healthy life, a mature life, criticism is part of it. Watch this. So he gets into it. Verse 5 and 6. Look, he says, he says, better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. A fool's laughter is quickly gone. Like, like thorns crackling in a fire. <laughs> this is also meaningless. What a good word. Why is this such a good word? And why is he like connecting this with dying and, and wisdom? Because, because the point here, my friends, is that most people don't pass the test of criticisms. I've met many people who, who, who say, I want to be great. But the moment they get criticized, they deflate. Sometimes I'm wary of people who are like, Pastor, I want you to mentor me. I'm like, are, are you sure? I told a good friend of mine who was another pastor, I said, he asked me, I said, bro, we're friends. I might have to tell you some stuff you don't want to hear. Because for me to be where I am today, I have to hear some things I don't want to hear. 
But, but are you teachable? Because if you want a great life, you have to be able to embrace criticism. And funny thing is, everybody on the surface says, I want to be great. But not everybody can withstand criticism to be great. Notice what he says. He's, I love this. He says, he says, it's better to be criticized by a, help, by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. In other words, please, if you're taking notes, I love, this is a great mature word. Not all praises have the same value. Not all praises have the same value. But if you're thirsty, you'll take any praise. I try to teach this. I told the staff the other day, I'm like, when someone praises you, check your own heart, not theirs. Because not all praises have the same value. Unless you're insecure and you don't know who you are. Young people, this is so important, especially young ladies. Not every dude who tells you you're beautiful has good motives. So if you're thirsty and insecure, you might fall for a dude who told you that for the wrong reasons. I said this before, I said it again, and I stand by it. My prayer for our young girls in our church is that you are so valued and you're so beautiful, you know who you are, then when someone says that to you, you don't have to say it out loud, but in your heart you're like, Negro, please. Because I'm sick and tired of seeing beautiful girls getting roped in into lies. And if you're that dude, you're the fool. So, so we have to discern our way through criticisms and praises. Because sometimes it's the praise that will get you. If you're not discerning. Then not all praises are, have equal value. So here's a saying we love to say, right? Don't let praises get, get to your head, but also don't let criticism get to your heart. Yeah. Now, let me, let me make that clear. I'm talking about destructive criticism, not constructive criticism. Because constructive criticism is how you live a great life. Matter of fact, here's what you need to think about anytime someone criticizes you. This is a, a rated M word now, a mature word, audience only. Is what can I learn from this? What can I learn from this criticism? If you have someone in your life who loves you enough to tell you the truth, you're a blessed person. Because some people claim to have friends, but their friends never tell them the truth. Like, I always think about that when I watch American Idol. I'm like, these people don't have friends. <laughs> How do you let your friend go all the way to national television without a talent? You're not a friend. So I always get mad at the friends, not the person. The fool who went all the way. Because <laughs> at karaoke night, Johnny was like, woo! Yeah! Now realizing Johnny's had five or six Kool-Aids. <laughs> Everything sounds good at that point. <laughs> if you don't have anyone to check on you with your marriage, then you don't have a good life. Dudes, if you don't have other dudes telling you the truth about your marriage, then you don't have good friends. But if you have a friend who can tell you, dude, you need to go home and spend time with your wife and spend time with your kids, then you should receive that and say, man, I have a good friend. If you're always going to the mall and wasting money and you don't have a friend who's like, girl, what's good with... If, if, if she's the one always like... Let's just go shopping. You don't have a good friend. Or you might be that friend. Because the problem is, I was reading this again and it just hit me like, no matter how old you are, you are still a byproduct of your environment. I, I was just reading this, it blew my mind. They said among scientists, 
high scientists, like NASA qualified scientists, there is also a stigma where you have to fall into the narrative. So a lot of them are believers, but they won't say it because of the environment. Think about that. Scientists who have to be quiet because their environment says you can't believe. So how sad is it when we have people around us who are not really telling us the truth? Just telling you what you want to hear. When you post something on social media, notice the people that comment. And a lot of times we're posting something hoping that the people that we agree with will comment. And we're creating these echo chambers where we're just being fed lies after lies because we don't never listen to the other side. And the way that social media is now, algorithms are all hinting towards what you want to believe. So you watch a video, they'll give you other videos about the things you want to believe. And we wonder why our society is so jacked up and divided because we only listen to one side. The people that listen to CNN don't watch Fox. The people who watch Fox don't watch CNN. And here we are. The problem is, we're not Democrats or Republicans, we're God's people. God's people see things differently. How can I grow from this criticism? Because here's the, here's the hardest part about this. Behind every criticism, there might be a hint of truth there. Here's what fools do today. Anytime someone criticizes you, we automatically go to the hating. You never grow with this hater mindset. You will never make progress in life if you think that everybody who called you out is hating on you. That's a fool. That's a fool who keeps making the same mistake and hoping for a different result. When someone is trying to tell you the truth. If you have someone in your life willing enough to tell you the truth, man, you should thank God because we live in a society where no one wants the truth. We'd rather, we rather fall for a lie than to embrace truth. That's the time we live in. We'd rather have people lie to us. Have you noticed something? Sometimes we do this. We need to make a decision. But you know who to go to to tell you what you want to hear versus the person that's going to tell you the truth. <laughs> Have you ever done this? I know, listen, I've been in church long enough. I know, like I used to be a youth pastor. And kids know which youth leader to go to. Who's going to co-sign their nonsense. And they know which youth leader to avoid. Because we want to hear what we want to hear. You know what the Bible says? There's going to come a time we're going to have itchy ears. Just tell me what I want to hear. Don't tell me the truth. But Jesus says, it's the truth that sets you free. So go to the person that's going to tell you the truth because you want to live a freedom life, not a lie. When I meet with my pastor, I'm always like... <sighs> Let me be ready for the truth in love. <laughs> because he's gracious, he's, 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 he's wise, but he will tell me what I need to hear. Man, we need that in the church. We need that in the church. I was telling one of our young men who I just thank God for, you know, I get to mentor Dre, and he's a young kid, he's a young like, he's, he's going to be an amazing leader. But I told him, I said, and I didn't ask for permission to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. And I'll apologize later, Dre. But I told him how the first conversation we ever had, I told him to do something difficult. And, I, and in my mind, going to that conversation was, this is either going to make or break this relationship. And to his credit, he received it. And he's been teachable all along. And it's been almost four years now that we've had this mentor relationship. And guess what? In life, you're going to have those moments. People call you out on something because they love you, they care about you. And how your response is, I'm either want to be wise or I just want to be a fool. It doesn't matter how old you are. Sometimes the older you are, the more you're stuck in your ways. They say you can't teach old dogs new tricks. Well, then be born again because you, you need to learn the ways of the Lord. You need to learn 
the ways of God. Since we're in the subject, let me tell you one of, my, one of the things that's so funny. I've been in church long enough. Sometimes when you call people out, they don't want to face the music. They'll say stuff like, God told me it's time to move on. But I find it fascinating. God always tells them to move on after they get offended. <laughs> Just think about that. Just <laughs> Imagine you're in, in a marriage and your spouse says, God told me to move on. <laughs> to which I'd be like, where did he say that? <laughs> because even, even this, listen, now we're already in this deep water. Let me go there. Even this like loosey goosey divorce stuff, not co signed by God. This is man made stuff. I'm talking about wisdom now. Where sometimes in your marriage you need correction, you need someone to tell you the truth. How am I going to grow without knowing? Here's the, here's, the, here's the thing we all have blind sides. I have blind sides. How am I going to grow if someone doesn't call out the blind side? How am I going to grow if there's no one there to, to tell me what I need to hear versus what I want to hear? Come on, you're getting too quiet on me. I'm telling you the truth. Watch this. King David blows my mind when he says this in, in Psalm 141. Watch this. He says, look at this. He said, let the godly strike me. It will be a kindness if they correct me. It's soothing medicine. Don't let me refuse it, but I pray constantly against the wicked and their deeds. David's like, hit me. You know when people say, only God can judge me? You're like, you don't want that. Please, you judge me before I get to him. That's the point of having accountability. Hey, judge me now so when I get to him, I'm not being judged by the things I didn't correct before I got to him. By the way, the Bible never said only God can judge me. Tupac did. <laughs> Just so we're clear. Because y'all taking stuff from society and put it in here. You know, the Bible says only God can judge me. You, you show me. He says, judge each other, he says. You know that if you call yourself a believer, you, you just said, judge me. I don't know if you understand that. Like, he says, don't judge the world, which we do all wrong. We're out here judging people who don't even say they call themselves a believer, and we're supposed to judge each other so that we don't get before the judge and get condemned forever. So I hope if you're a believer in Jesus, you said, hey, judge me now. I'm one believer. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> judge me now. Don't, don't let me be a fool and get before a holy God. And didn't address the stuff I needed to address. So you want to be a great person in life? Embrace correction. You know the Bible says that the Bible comes to inspire you, challenge you, motivate you, correct you, and rebuke you. So that you may become a man and a woman of God. Sometimes people will ask for an opinion. You give it and then they go quiet. I've had emails, pastor, blah, 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 and then I respond. It's like, radio silence. I didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. Like today, this, this is not what you wanted to hear today. So you're going to go home and be like, let me find another pastor who tells me how to live my best life now. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. I don't even have time to keep going. I spent too much time on this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to the end. Okay, because I just spent too much time on this. But look, look. Verse 13. We're going to jump to verse 13. Just jump ahead. Just, just jump ahead. Accept the way God does things. For who can straighten what he has made crooked? Enjoy prosperity while you can. But when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in this life. Nothing is certain in this life. Wisdom, my friends, is accepting 
the mysteries of God's will that I don't understand. That's wisdom. Some things I will never understand. I will never make sense of some of the stuff in this world. That's where I, my faith in God comes into play. Solomon goes on to say this in Ecclesiastes 11. In worship team, this is your cue. But don't get distracted, squirrel. Stay with me. <laughs> look, he says this. In, in chapter 11, he said, look, he says, just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in his mother's womb, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. There's some things beyond us. We don't understand. Like, a baby growing in his mother's womb, you, you can talk about the science of it all, but man, it's, there's a mystery there. You just can't make sense of it all. Like I was watching birds flying the other day, and I'm like, we can talk about, like, the... The, the resistance to the wind and the wing and all of that, but, I, but like, that thing is gliding. <laughs> like, I don't know how you make sense of that. Because you can say, I know how a bird flies, but do you really know? Like, do you actually really know the mystery of that reality of a bird just flying and them knowing when to migrate? Blows my mind. And the unity that they do that, like, like they're talking with each other, Jesus says, consider them. See how I take care of them? I created them to do that, just like I created you. So trust me on things that you may not understand. That's wisdom. I don't understand it all, God, but I trust you in this. I don't know what this is for you because we're all on the journey. There's different things happening in your world in your life. Today I want to leave you with a prayer. It's a prayer that's made famous in the addiction world, but it, it wasn't made, created for addiction. It was actually about life. It's the prayer of serenity. I leave you with this prayer today because sometimes you just have to trust God. But you got to listen to the whole prayer, not just part of it. The whole prayer goes like this, and I pray you, you Google it, look it up, and, and make it part of your prayer life, because sometimes you just got to pray this prayer. Look what the prayer says. It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage, because it takes courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time. Enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardships as the pathway to peace. Taking, as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. And sometimes all things right means in all eternity. So that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Would you stand with me? Pray for wisdom, my friends. The Bible says that the wisdom of God is foolishness to those who don't believe. It says the cross, it's foolishness to those who are wise in their own ways. But it's in the fullness of God that we find salvation. If you've never trusted Jesus as the Savior of your life, you have to embrace God's foolishness over what the world thinks is foolishness. God says, I do things to confound the wise. There are incredible smart people in this world who don't believe in God. The only time the Bible addresses atheism in the Bible, he says, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. That's the only time. 
He says, man, how do you look at the world and say, no, there's no creator. We're here on our own. That's a fool. But you see, atheism, it's not just saying I don't believe in God. Atheism is living like there's no God. You could be in church and go home and live like you're your own God. We can call that Christian atheism. You say you're a Christian, but you live like, I got this. So you got you to gotta face the music and say, if I've truly surrendered my life to Jesus, where he really is the Lord of my life, like to live is Christ. To die will be gain one day. With every head bow, eyes closed, this is a moment of decision. When the Bible brings you this close, you have to make a decision. Is it God's will or is it your will? I pray today you trust God and you let his will be done. Even when things don't make sense. You are, all of us are one prayer away from Jesus. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he's God, that he, he died and rose again. He defeated sin. He defeated death. So that you don't have to live in fear. You can live in hope when you submit to him. So I'm going to pray this prayer. If that's you today, I hope and pray that you open your heart because you have to do it by choice. No one can make you do this. But if that's you, pray this with me. Pray this prayer from your heart saying, Father, today I want to surrender my life to you. I need forgiveness for my sins. I want to live a life worth living. I want to live with the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. I pray that Jesus would come into my life and forgive me of my sins and empower me to live according to your will. So I pray today you fill me with your Holy Spirit because my life is yours. And eternity 